Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Steve Marks, Chair of the CMC Board of Trustees and President of Hannah News Service here in Columbus. It's great to see you. Metro Club live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation and in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. We'd like to thank those of you watching today who purchased a virtual seat for this forum. We are very grateful for your support and are able to continue live streaming services in large part because of you. Thank you again. You can learn more about CMC, register for events, join or renew your membership, or make a donation anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. Today's forum is presented in partnership with the United Way of Central Ohio and sponsored by Encova and Marzetti. I'd like to introduce Matt Shirty, General Counsel and Secretary at Lancaster Colony Corp to uh, introduce our forum. Matt. Thank you, Steve. I'm Matt Shirty, General Counsel of Lancaster Colony, which is the parent company of T. Marzetti. After the tragic death of George Floyd, our company decided to do more to bring diversity and inclusion to the forefront of our culture. We had the good fortune of bringing in Clarence Mingo as our VP of ESG, and ever since then, he and I have been working side by side, not only to increase minority representation in our company, but also to have the difficult conversations that may surround this, this topic. It has been a matter of a great personal journey and professional journey for me. I couldn't be more happy to be a part of it. And while we all may have different opinions about how to move forward, two things seem universal to me. The first is that we have to take the time to listen and learn from people with different perspectives. And the second is that we must work together to empower change in our community. And with that, I'm pleased to ask you to join me in welcoming Program Manager of My Brother's Keeper, Department of Neighborhoods, City of Columbus, Chris Sewell, Community Activist and Mother of Henry Green, Adrian Hood, CEO of Afrocentric Personal Development Shop, Jerry Saunders Sr., and our host today, Assistant Executive Director and Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, Franklin County Children's Services, LaShawn Clark. LaShawn, stage is yours. Thank you, Matt. If hindsight is 2020, what are we willing to do differently in 2021 to dismantle the influence of systemic racism? What we have come to understand is that the system that is institutional racism was created, implemented, and sustained with intentionality, and is that same intentionality that is required to dismantle it. In an effort to solve for that opening question, I would like to take this moment in time to explore the word grace. Grace is defined as a concept that means undeserved kindness. It is going out of your way to bestow your compassion and love towards a person, even if, even if they might not appreciate it or return the favor. At its fullest extent, it is choosing to act positively towards someone who might hate you or have done you wrong. That is the most generous interpretation of the word I can muster. Amid the last month or so, I have to be honest that it is hard to offer grace in the midst of so much oppression and heartache. Almost like a grace fatigue has set in. A feeling where you are tired of giving grace and begin crying out for accountability and atonement. I have come to understand that one of the shortcomings of defining grace is that it doesn't account for the person that receives our most generous or graceful interpretations of their actions. In the last month, African Americans in Columbus have been asked by society to offer grace in light of the murders of Casey Goodson Jr. and Andre Hill in our very own backyard. When the protest started last summer, I recall many people in Columbus wondering aloud, why are so many people protesting so strongly against something that happened over 700 miles away? Well, for many of us, it has always been abundantly clear that the conditions that led to the murder of George Floyd exist in our very own community. And if we are unwilling to do anything about those conditions, it is only a matter of time before it happens here again. You see, Columbus is not immune to the pandemic of police violence. We have simply lived with it as part of our reality, and it continues to happen. Over the next hour, I invite you to pay attention to a few things. I invite you to pay attention to your breathing, your heart rate, the texture of your skin, 
These are the systems that communicate stress to our brains. When these systems are maxed out, it is then when we are most challenged to offer grace. And yet, in this moment in time, that is precisely what we are asked to do. Offering grace comes at a great emotional cost. We are a society in crisis, and the people furthest from opportunity are expected to offer the most grace. We are expected to do much of the emotional heavy lifting while simultaneously extending to those with all the opportunities the space to move forward without the emotional responsibilities vulnerability and honesty require. In the midst of the continued loss of life, there looms the existential threat of violence that puts those that are the most vulnerable in a perpetual state of crisis. The truth of it, though, is that grace is not just for the vulnerable as a preconceived construct that we need to carefully define, nor is it a permanent fixture in our lives. It lives on a delicate balance, in fact. If we call for grace without calling for accountability and restitution, even the most graceful among us will become weary. We are feeling that now. Instead, we have to invite each other to search that feeling we get in our gut when all is unraveling and act on our instinct to fight for change. When we can't become, what we can't become is a community that relies on grace in absence of our work to acknowledge or reconcile our need for it. We certainly can't let grace become the balm for untreated affliction. In the wake of recent events, many are being asked to be graceful yet again. There was an attack on our country that will go down in history as one of the most reprehensible acts ever known against our democracy. Yet there are many ready to sweep it under the rug to unify our country or show grace to those grieving the tough loss in a hard fought election. That same desire to heal, recover and repair is required when facing down racism. Since 1619, when those first 20 enslaved Africans arrived at the ports in Jamestown, Virginia, the black experience has been riddled with atrocity after brutal atrocity. Where do we go from here? Anywhere but here. If we are to ever truly dismantle systemic racism, we have to commit to the necessary conversations and the corresponding actions that will eradicate the influence racism has had on our society for far too long. As we move forward, we need to begin the conversations that will lead to social change. We need to uncover solutions that translate into long-term investment and partnership with the black community. Over the next few minutes, we will discuss the issues of wealth and poverty, health, education, and criminal justice. We need to acknowledge that while these issues are persistent and worsening, it will take our intentional effort to reverse our most devastating outcomes. I'd now like to invite our esteemed panel to chime in. This is meant to be a free-flowing conversation, so feel free to jump in. Um, but this initial question, we're going to start with uh, Mr. Jerry Saunders. As we talk about systemic inequities, what does that look like to you? What about your work as an advocate or your lived experience inform your perspective? Thank you, Mr. Carter. First of all, I'd like to thank the Columbus uh, Metropolitan Club and United Way for inviting me to be able to contribute in this conversation with the rest of the panelists. Uh, when we talk about racism, I see it on two levels. I see the first, uh, for individuals, I call that biases. And that could be in a number of ways for color, wealth, size of people, where you live, a number of places. The racism, to me, is systemic. And I see that different than the biases. Now, for me, when I come from a personal perspective, just to make sure people can understand me, I'm like a history buff, but I like some movies, not too many. But one of my favorite movies is The Matrix. And those who are not familiar with The Matrix, it's like a dystopia, which is the opposite of utopia. Utopia is perfect. Dystopia is where inhumane folks are acting, being cruel to one another, not taking care of the environment and all of that. Well, it's this, that's this in society that the humans are unaware of that they're assimilated and they're participating in. And it's actually what we call the matrix in the movie, and then they find out that it's being ran by intelligent machines. It's not real, but that's what they see as their real world. Well, for me, what I see here is, with the racism part, is I see the same type of society that's not really the true society that was created by white males and programmed people in effect to be product or consumers so that those individuals, select few individuals, can maintain dominance and power 
in society. For me, greed and power are the driving forces. Racism is a strategy. It's a strategy that's used to distract people from wondering why they're the ones that are in power. Because see, at the end of the day, what I see is one race, human race. But this racism takes the human race and says, you're not gonna like somebody by the complexion of their skin. Now we're born innocent, but we end up not liking folks by the complexion of their skin or their culture when it's really just one race. But that's that strategy that's put in there that keeps us going back and forth with one another. And I'm gonna hold up here because I could go on and on, but I just wanted to give you my piece on racism. I think that it's systemic. I think that it's used there to separate us and to keep us apart while certain folks in a capitalistic society now dominate and maintain that control. Because if you recall, the first time we were bought here was for economic reasons, to do the farming. Mm -hmm. While I know we talk about 16, 19, those are indentured slaves that were so supposedly have a deal to be working for two, seven years, nine years. The first brother that really got caught was a guy named John Punch in 1640, where the Virginian Commons actually legally, for the lawyers here, legally made it so that he would be have indentured servitude for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Now the record was so John Casler did it too, and he was involved on the farm with Anthony Johnson, who was a brother from Angola who had the farming there. But that happened legally. I can tell you a little bit more about that, cause, but I don't want to just consume. We said this is <laughs> we a rolling conversation, that, that but we can and, go and on. That historical knowledge, absolutely. That has something to do with the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm at it, I might as well, if y'all don't mind. Yeah, please. I don't mind. Well, I'll just tell you, so what happened, Anthony Johnson was a brother from Angola, and he had a large plantation. And so he had folks who were here were indentured slaves. So two of the guys decided they had did their seven years, and they took off. White guy and a black guy, they took off. And so they send the patrol after them, you know. The, and these were, at that time, which is nowadays, it's the police, but the slave trade, they catch slave catchers. They sent them after, they caught them, brought them back. They go before court, the, and the white guy has to do a couple more years on his indentured servitude. The brother has to do it for the rest of his life. So when I think about that, I think about prison systems right now, how they occur, where African Americans will have an extended amount of time as opposed to other folks. And that was back in 1654, 55 with Johnson, mm -hmm. and 1640 with John Punch. So this has been going on a long time, yeah. and it's all been about economics. Yeah, and the different realities have been going on for a long time as well. Right, and every time you turn around, something occurs that uh, perpetuates that. Woodrow Wilson, when he was in, did the Federal Reserve, which is capitalism. He also did The Birth of the Nation, showed that movie there in the White House. That's where they, what do you call those now when you do the first movie? Uh, the premiere. The premiere yeah. in the White House, teaching the KKK and also putting down black folks in there, all those stereotypes. And that occurred then from the president's office. Yeah. And I think that similarly has been occurring in the last four years. Well, thank you for getting us started. Uh, I want to pull in Adrian and, and Chris to talk a little bit about your perspective on systemic issues and whether it be but through the lens of your work or your lived experience, how do you see it um, in, in Columbus specifically? Well, um, I concur with so many things that Mr. Saunders said. Um, and I have coined it as such the orchestrated evil mm -hmm. of this country that is still very well alive and functioning intentionally as it was created to be. Um, so what that looks like to me personally, I became a member of what I call the involuntary club four and a half years ago when my son was killed by Columbus police officers in plain clothes in an unmarked vehicle. And the lack of accountability the things that I have learned as far as the laws that are in place, qualified immunity at the top of the list, being, uh, being in existence to protect officers and public officials, period, which that has a historical connotation as well. Um, but the laws that exist to be able to protect them is not okay. And because of that, we continue to see a lack of accountability and, to your point, still being expected to show grace 
to show forgiveness. We're having this conversation today about healing, but we have to have a conversation about the pain that we are talking about healing. And if we can't have an honest conversation about that, then we will continue to go around this merry-go-round. We will continue to have conversations and there'll be little actions. There are things that can be done mm -hmm. in a very big way, but we have to have individuals that are bold enough, strong enough, and caring enough to make those changes happen. It can be done. Yeah, absolutely, and, and we saw in um, Amanda Gorman's uh, inaugural uh, poet, uh, poem, she, she said that hope and hurt have to, are coexisting right now. And, and, and in order for us to move forward, we have to recognize that while we are hurting, there are many of us that remain hopeful, but we can't move forward without addressing that hurt, without acknowledging that it's present and that it's based on real things and real experience. And so, Chris, I want to bring you in because you work specifically with a population that is trying to navigate that. Can you share a little bit about uh, how, how you are uh, facing down racism while carrying out the, the work of the My Brother's Keeper? Program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, NBK was created, you know, to help close some of those those same disparity gaps, you know, that go far back, you know, to what some, Mr. Saunders is talking about, talking about education, talking about health, um, talking about safety and economics. And so uh, in my role, I'm an advocate for, you know, boys and young men of color addressing some of those same needs. And over this past year, uh, NBK has directly focused on, you know, education and career readiness, you know, um, simply um, through our grant through our grant program. Um, Funding three community, I mean three community partners that focuses on improving, you know, high school success outcomes for our boys and men of color, right? And not just talking about when I graduate high school, you know, what's next. But as an eighth grader entering high school, am I socially and emotionally prepared to make that transition? Is my family prepared? You know, some of the things we don't talk about is how do we support families? Um, how do we provide wraparound service for families? you know, that are helping their students transition into that world. Going into high school is a whole new world. And so, you know, partnering with, you know, uh, Academy of Urban Solutions, you know, Cummins Refuge, Refuge, Refugees Immigration Services, um, and, and the Urban League is addressing some of those same needs. Um, and I think back to the conversation that we had prior to this, this meeting and talking about um, some movie called One Night in Miami. You know, Sam Cooke had made um, this statement, you know, I just don't want a piece of the American pie, I want the recipe. And so for and thinking about that, I'm thinking, you know, um, America was built on slavery. And so um, why are we now asking for, you know, a piece of uh, something that we built? You know, and it goes back to, you know, where we are now. We're asking for a part of history, we're asking for um, the American dream when we help build the American dream. And, and um, each of you have addressed uh, systemic uh, racism in your own way. Uh, Jerry, you shared the history and the economic impetus. Uh, Adrian, you talked a little bit about law enforcement and criminal justice. And Chris, you've talked a little bit about addressing issues of poverty and, and also as well as um, education and educating our young men in particular. What, what I wanted to ask and kind of bring it back is uh, we're living right now in what people are calling dual pandemics, right? We have the global pandemic of the coronavirus, but we also have that uh, more experiential pandemic of police violence and black lives in, je in jeopardy. And so uh, as you think about health and health care and, and these dueling pandemics, what, what does that elicit for you? What what perspectives would you like to offer? Any of you can jump in, in terms of what we're kind of living in, because we're seeing the disparities with the infection rates and also the death rates with black and brown communities. And we're also seeing, obviously, the over-representation of, of police violence in black communities. So how, how are you kind of walking that fine line between those two pandemics, and how are you engaging with the communities you serve in that regard? Any, any of you can jump well, in. I, I, um while I see all of those issues and concerns, I have a lot of hope mm -hmm. because I see the young folks, what's happening with the young people rising up and not only just, not, I'm not going to say protesting, I'm going to say it's a movement. It's not a protest, it's a movement, it's ongoing. And they're looking at it from the standpoint of legislatively and it's a whole bunch all if we want to say races, all races, all ages, and everybody else, and I don't think that it's something that is going to, it's just temporary. It's a movement that is going, and it is going strong. I think that the, the big piece is the truth that is out there. That's what will save us, us actually knowing the truth, and this technology allows for young people to get to that. So 
when we say make changes, I say there should be affirmative action and compensatory action. Affirmative action is leveling the playing field right now. Yeah. Compensatory action is making up for what has occurred because for us as African Americans, and, and, and I'm, we're not, we haven't even spoken about the Native American, the, the indigenous people who were here, whose land was taken. Uh, but talking about African Americans on there, I'd say 13 to maybe 15 generations of us were, didn't have that opportunity for generational wealth building. Mm -hmm. we, the opportunity we had was building other folks' generational wealth. Mm -hmm. We received generational trauma. And so it's been passed down from generation to generation, and then people will say, well, why don't you just go ahead and do what you need to do? Don't worry about it. Well, that did occur back in the 1860s with the Reconstruction period. From 63, 1863 to 1877, black folks did just rise up and start doing things and created their own community, politics, everything else. And then Rutherford B. Hayes, trying to win the election, pulled the National Guard out of the South so that the Ku Klux Klan could come in and all that violence and everything occurred at that time to suppress that movement that black folks were making at that time. Yeah. I think that suppression still occurs. It's just more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And I think that the young people that I see and know, like you guys, are on it. And, uh, and that makes me feel good about it. I don't think it's going to take all that time, and I appreciate what everybody else has done including people in my generation and myself. We moved little by little, but I think you guys got it moving a lot faster. And the fact that we're here today talking about racism like we are is a major piece, too. So I just got a lot of hope about it yeah. and where we headed. Thank you. Adrian, Chris, and you want to? Yeah, so um, to Mr. Saunders' point, we're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And they, like you said, the young people, um, that are out there now, they have that zeal. It is up to us as elders and and our elders <laughs> to um, to you know to to bring them in and, and teach them the historical piece, so that we are able to continue to connect these dots. Um, because again, like Mr. Saunders said, there were some of our ancestors who were doing the work, who had come together collectively to, to build wealth, to build communities. And every single time yeah. that it happened on a grand scale, trauma, terror came in and destroyed those communities. Not because they were doing anything illegal, but it was because they were thriving that is an issue. That is generational trauma. How do we deal with that now? Yeah. Because it is a lot of it in our communities. Our young people that are, that are getting gunned down and this violence that we are seeing, it did not just happen in 26, 2017 when the, we had our highest number of homicides in Columbus. It didn't just happen last year when we surpassed that number. This has been going on. There are services, there are, there are finances that are available for the services that we need to, to um, implement real healing in our communities. And that money is always diverted somewhere else. We cannot and we will not continue to accept that. Yeah, absolutely. I think everything that NBK has done, you know, has been done in a way that we allow our youth to have the platform to lead. You know, like Mr. Saunders said, everything this summer was, was youth led. You know, and for us as adults now, we have to provide them the resources to lead, but also allow them to lead and make and, and make those mistakes so that they can't take over. Um, you know, we've done a lot of grant programs even this summer. You know, when we've seen that rise in violence, when we've seen you know a lot of the recreational parks or programs had to cut back due to COVID, we were able to then fund three community organizations that allowed us to pay pay our youth, but also receive programming, mentoring you know, Wellness Wednesdays and have those tough conversations with cops. I remember one of the programs that we um, we funded through the CARES Act dollar was Legacy U. Legacy U had these these conversations on called Wellness Wednesdays. And on that Wednesdays, they brought in two um, police officers, two black police officers, and they had those conversations. The police officers asked the youth, what is it that we can do you know, to make you guys feel safe in the community. And it's having those conversations about, you know, what it is that we're missing, you know, and filling those gaps. And for the youth, 
you know, having them show that, you know, we're nothing to be afraid of. And so um, everything that we've done is striving to providing that opportunity to ensure that our youth are successful long term because the, how we equip them now coming out of this pandemic will, will, will let us know that the longevity we have, you know, and breaking down some of those barriers and habits that we had going into it. I think one thing I will say is that I think COVID has uh, allowed for the bar to be set um, low, right, because it was easy to give up. I, basically, since you had 18 months worth of almost a throwaway year, and so to break those habits, we have to continue to set the bar high for our students, not only for our students, but our youth, right? The bar is here. No matter where you come out of COVID, we, we still have that, that bar to be high. And the same with education. You know, education essentially almost as if we got a pass, right? There's no testing, so youth lost that motivation. And so making sure that um, giving our students that, that, that key to education will is a foundation, but also providing some experience, um, some mentorship, and some guidance to move into the future uh, will help our youth propel in the future. Yeah, you touched on something that um, I wanted to explore a little further in, in the idea of conversations. Um, and for, for those, uh, those of us who have been a part of this work for a very long time, um, there's, a, there's a lot of people who are saying the time of talking is over. Uh, we actually need to start acting and doing. Um, and, and while I agree with that sentiment, I do believe that there's space and there's room for conversation. Um, one of the things that uh, I like to talk about with others who are engaged in this work is that um, no one can do something well that they can't also speak too well. You have to be able to explain what you're doing. You have to be able to have the conversation in order to do the work. And so um, how do we encourage, in, in, or through, in that vein, how do we encourage more listening, dialogue, and understanding? And, and when we are trying to have these conversations, where should they happen? And anyone can jump in on that. I think we, we are most comfortable, you know. Um, I think that sometimes we can sit from a place of privilege, right, because we have our degrees, you know, we have a good working paying jobs, but, you know, people outside of the, the, our people that we know, you know, are, are suffering. You know, we're in survival, black people are in survivor mode, and you've seen that through the pandemic. And so for us, you know, it's, it's being able to listen where they feel most comfortable, right, going to their communities, going to the schools, uh, going to the community centers. You know, Columbus has a tremendous amount of programming that addresses a lot of the needs that we have, but it's also it's about giving um, the families in the community the access to that, right? You know, finding out how do you access a lot of the programs and resources that we have. You know, we see a lack of uh, parent engagement. We've seen a lack of parent engagement um, in the past, and so for us, it's asking a question to the parents: How do you, how do you, how is it best that we engage you? Because ultimately, they have the decision on, on helping our youth move forward. But it's asking those tough questions, you know. How, how are you today? Are you able to pay the rent? You know, how can I provide you, um, your son, with mentoring? You know, do you need transportation? We know that that's a need, right? Asking those questions that sometimes may be uncomfortable, but in the end, it, it will get us to where we need to move the needle going forward. Yeah. Anyone, you want to jump into? Yeah. And I, I agree with Mr. Soil, except I would ask him if I would have permission to change, to talk where it's most comfortable to where it's most needed. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because for instance, an example would be a lot of times when the election comes up, you will have uh, white politicians come to black churches and talk about racism and helping out in the neighborhood. I think they need to go to the white churches mm. and talk about that and what's needed and how everybody can work together instead of just coming and giving lip service there, but actually go to make some action occur uh, with some folks who may have the influence to make that, that occur. So I just want to just uh, add on, on top of that to what he, he <laughs> no, that's, said that's, right that's there. A, that's a good point. And I think, you know, it's, it's going on now, people talking more, and you're going to get the negative and the positive, but at least people are talking and trying to figure out things. But at the end of the day, I still think the truth is the best thing because, you know, most of us believe what, we're, what our significant other, our parents or whoever's close to us teach us. Mm -hmm. Most of us believe that. And sometimes we grow up a little older and we go, wow, that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Some things we accept it and leave it alone, some things we don't. And so things like Santa Claus. Yeah. I hope our kids aren't watching. But you know, <laughs> we little and we go Santa Claus, Santa Claus, and we get older and we go, what? Yeah. And then when we get kids, Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. Now that's something simple. Yeah. But take racism, bias. When somebody's teaching that I'm better than you or I'm not as good as you when you're younger, and they get older and find out that it's different and then we start doing it with our children because with African Americans, we want our children to be safe. So we're saying, hey, yeah. 
Watch it when you go out and how you drive. And we, that permeates and that changes that kid from feeling like I can just do whatever I want to, you know, got that energy. Yeah. So it's just a lot of those things. I think that is detrimental in a number of ways because we do pass. I mean, it's a simple thing. We teach sunrise and sunset. Mm -hmm. We know that the sun stay right where it is and the earth just rotates. Yeah. Why don't we teach people that, you know, but we teach them. I'm just saying we get accustomed to teaching lies like that. So when we start telling lies, people do not respond or hold people accountable yeah. for lies as we just have experienced. Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the things that's true is um, we are a society built around kindness and being polite. And, and sometimes that kindness and that willing, willingness to be polite allows things that are the most devastating to persist because we're not willing to have the hard and necessary conversation that may put you in a position where you're a little uncomfortable and you're a little stressed. But if that's the necessary conversation, the reality is we have to resist the urge of that retreat, that walking away from that hard or difficult conversation because it's so necessary. And because we want to sp speak truth to power yeah. and we want to make sure that we're, we're able to, to, to de demystify this idea of race and racism in our society. And so the point that you opened with in that having majority and, and majority people and white people have conversations among themselves about these issues as they become more informed and more educated on the issues is an important aspect of disruption. Mm -hmm. um, before we transition, Adrian, did you want to jump in or add anything to that? Or I, I kind of wanted to go back to something that Chris um, brought up earlier um, as far as the access and the help um, to the young people. Um, personally, because I worked in the district for so many years, um, we need to get to the babies. We spend a lot of time on intervention mm -hmm. when we could be doing a whole lot more with prevention. Why do we have to have our seventh and eighth graders and our high schoolers going through all of these areas of trauma and then expressing that out into the community when I um, went to a, a summons years ago uh, when my um, sons were younger, and it was called Breaking um, the Academic Gap Between African American Males and Everyone. And the specialist that came in and spoke to us said that based off a second and third grade test, they already know how many prisons they need to build. Mm -hmm. Second and third grade. So by the time we get to seventh and eighth grade, there's a lot of children had, who have already been written off. That's not okay. You are saying that a seven or an eight year old, you have already checked the box on? Yeah. Yeah. That's not okay. And that's true. And that goes to those hard conversations that we need to have because in that um, session that I went to, I sat at the table with educators mm -hmm. who were from the suburbs. They thought I was an educator. So they're like, well, what do we do with them? Mm -hmm. I clench my bag <laughs> because I have two of them mm -hmm. that you're referring to. And when they realized that I wasn't a teacher, I said, I don't know, maybe you could try talking to them mm -hmm. like you do the rest of your students. Yeah. Expressing the same respect level that you do to the rest of your students. Yeah. Their and faces I, were cherry red yeah. because they thought that I was an educator. And for our school systems to have so many European-American um, teachers, male and female, in those spaces, like you said, the hard conversations have to be had, but we cannot just have conversations. At that point, you have to have a heart check and you have to be determined to make those changes because they are leading our children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Just to mention something, you know, you spoke about um, the preventative work. You know, a lot of what MBK does is preventative work, right? But it's mm -hmm. through our grant programs and through our grantees. You know, a lot of the work that we task, not even task, but ask them to do when applying for this grant is provide those preventative measures to allow our students to have that toolkit to be successful. And when I said access, I mean access because having the access for the parents to get. We do so much work as it pertains to our boys and men of color, but 
people don't know how to access and information it's yeah. out there Absolutely. you know technology is right there and so providing opportunities and resources that that families can access at a greater level is why i said access but people don't know that a lot of the work that we do ensures it's preventative work to ensure a lot of the things that go in our communities don't happen you know when we when we had that summer program we, we had over about 200 kids that were that were part of that that summer you program and out of those 200 kids we only had three kids that were involved in criminal activities and so when i say preventative work that's the work that we're doing through them that gives our students an opportunity to grow Thank you for that, absolutely. Um, we will move the questions from our live stream audience in just a few minutes. But uh, before we move on, I, I wanted to um, go back to something that Adrian, I think you said, and, and when you were at that conference, um, we talk about the, the, the willingness to resist that urge to retreat or to walk away from the difficult conversation, you could have easily done that. You could have easily decided, you know, I'm not going to speak up. I'm just going to let them say what they say and move on. Um, but you also could have canceled them, right? And, and, and so when we talk about resisting that urge to retreat, you're also, we're also talking about resisting that urge to cancel and bring people into the conversation so that we can um, provide more information, lead to more discussions, and inform people in ways that may change their perspectives or give them just a, another way, another point of view as it relates to the black experience in America. Um, but when thinking about the majority population, how might they become more allied towards equity? Um, I can uh, go. I want to do comment on what I'm ready on what she said on there is that Right, we want to have that conversation, but there's got to be a willingness to want to change. And right now, I believe that COVID, and the reason I, I, I know that people have lost folks and they're sick and all, and, and I definitely have my condolences on that. I, I do look at that word, because I, like I say, I, I look at words of history, per COVID, and I go call out the CO, the VID, the vivid truth. Now, it has, you can see it in a number of areas, economically, health, education, all of those places you see it. So when you say people, white folks, black folks, anyone who want to help, it's obvious right now. I mean, it's just right there, and it has, it's not going anywhere anywhere soon. So we can work towards making that happen. I think people got to look at their individual biases, too, to make sure that they really are doing something that's coming from their heart as opposed to trying to prove something. Yeah. And so the one quick test on the educators was, and I won't go into all the details, but they had to, this guy did a test where he had teachers looking, they were at a teacher's conference, and he had a video, and he had the teachers look into this video, and they were to look for issues that children, the real small children were having, so that, uh, having that they could prevent them from being troublemakers in the class. I'll try to be quick with this, too. And so, what they had on there was a, a machine that could trace where their eyes would go to. So they had the black girl, black boy, white girl, white boy. And what they did with all the teachers, all the teachers, the majority of teachers, when they looked for the trouble, they were trying to look for most of them, that machine could tell where they looked, they looked at the black boy automatically. Now, when he told them afterwards and told them what was going on, they did not want to acknowledge so that he could write this down officially what they had experienced. But he still wrote it down without using their... But that's something right there. They saw that, that they had something to prove their bias. Mm -hmm. But because of their self-pride or whatever the case may be, they did not want to acknowledge yeah. that they did that. Yeah. Either one of you want to just add anything on how that we get the majority population to engage in these equity efforts and be uh, seen as allies or co-conspirators in doing this work? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the biggest things, and we've seen, you know, in working with Mr. Saunders and Summers, is in increasing funding. You know, we see time and time again where funding is only on a, a yearly basis, and there's so many organizations that um, that are on the grassroots levels doing the work, but they don't have the capacity. But how do we help them build capacity, provide more training? You know, they may not have a fiscal manager. A lot of these organizations that can um, take in these organiz I mean, take in these small organizations, it's helped be their fiscal manager. And so I think providing funding, more funding on an annual basis instead of a yearly basis will go a long way in, pro in providing opportunity for our youth to stay engaged this summer. Yeah. Well, we definitely need to have more grassroots organizations getting the funding. Mm -hmm. um, I have, you know, again, been in this just really um, in the last four and a half years as far as organizations and grassroots organizations and the things that they, um, you know, that they get involved in. And funding is always an issue. And to learn that there are 
to your point, there's fiscal agents um, that that they have to go to to get this funding. The challenge to me is the fiscal agents not really believing in the grassroots work, yeah. which could then line up with their biases potentially. So they're not given the funding, even though they're continuing to do the work. Like Divine One Health, Esther does a phenomenal job on the West Side with the street, the, the street sisters, yeah. um, does a phenomenal job. But funding, I have seen her go down to city council and almost scream to the top of her lungs trying to get funding. We have to figure out a way, as you said, to be able to get that access to the grassroots organizations because honestly and truthfully, they are the ones that are doing the, doing the work. They are taking the risk, even in COVID, they are taking the risk and getting out there to help our, um, you know, our most disadvantaged yeah. Uh, people. Yeah, historically, social change has been built on the backs of the grassroots, particularly black-led grassroots organizations. Absolutely. And, and so that, that investment is necessary in order for the change to really be sustained. Uh, Jerry, one last question, then we're going to go to Jane. All right, I was just going to say, most of what we're saying is resource, opportunity, and remove the barriers. Yeah. And we got it. Yeah, we thank you. It. There it is. Jane, please, any questions from the live stream? We have a lot of questions that were submitted ahead of time, as well as quite a few on the live stream, so I'm going to go quickly. Tom Carlisi from Carlisi & Associates, what is being planned systematically in our community to foster more empathy and understanding between sectors of our community that are divided in order to encourage more experiential, constructive connections and behavior change? Anyone want to? What I would say is, um, but, and, and please feel free to jump in. I'll respond at least, at least a little bit, is that uh, many organizations are setting up these community dialogues that are inviting in uh, more constituents to be part of the, the cultivation of solutions. And so what I would say to that question in particular is that creating systemic solutions will require systemic participation. So when because what usually happens is when we start having these community conversations, often they're led and run by, uh, by grassroots organizations, and often the participants are largely nonprofit organizations, community members, uh, and, and other smaller groups. And the private sector isn't present for those conversations. And so what, in order for a systemic change to happen, you need a diverse population part of the conversation, seeking those solutions, not only representing cultural identity, but also representing personal and professional interests, like the private sector, like government, like nonprofit, all collectively solving for the same thing. You bring that diversity of thought, you're gonna get some systemic solutions. Anyone else? I have to disclose that Tom Carlisi and I are good friends. Okay. All right. But we actually, help bring nonviolent communication to the city of Columbus. And we had gotten out of Atlanta from Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, and it, and it, it advocates this type of conversation mm -hmm. that is going on. And it has been not just here in Columbus, but around the, the uh, state and around the, 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 actually the world. He's moved it to other places, other countries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Suzanne Davis, Questline Inc. Uh, I, as, as a small company of less than 50, we'd like to have more diverse population of employees, but we don't often have job openings, and when we do, the applicants come from the broadest of job boards like Indeed and LinkedIn do not represent the Columbus population, and our qualified pool of, of applicants is not very diverse. We've tried advertising in a couple new places, Black Columbus and Stonewall, but have not seen a change. Uh, we don't have relocation benefits available, so posting in HBCs outside of CBUS is not helpful. What can we do? I would say provide more internships. You know, a lot of the, uh, the large organizations or small organizations um, having internships with some of our high school students that need, you know, our internship hours, uh, even college students inter need internship hours is good because then, one, that's word of mouth, um, and it's also opportunity for those students who then finish school to come back and have somebody already have familiarity with your organization. So offering internships, uh, reaching out to our city schools, you know, offering them, you know, start, you know, you don't have to pay them a lot of money, but providing them access at younger ages then gives opportunity for those students once they get older and have familiarity to come back and then be an employee of Diverse Market. Is your organization um, a touch point to yes. find interns? Yes, we are in a touch point. Okay. 
Um, Mary Rosling of Fifth Third, how can I continue to educate myself as a white person? What can I do to help the black community? There's bias in every race. I believe we each have to do better and be better. What are ways that we can do, what are, what are things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to prevent bias or to teach our next generation to not repeat history? My, my favorite saying is build community. And it's the same, I don't care what group of folks you are, you have the same needs in those communities for a good health care system, good education system, all of those employment, good housing, all of those things are needed in all of the communities. But for whatever reason, it's separate in different communities. And if we're gonna make those changes, people need those things in order to have those type of communities. And so, so it's a bigger than, so, it, so I know that that one person can't do that, they're asking about themselves, but any kind of way they can contribute to that. And I say the same on employment. You know, you start employing people, then you get connected to more folk. But what I do say, I appreciate whatever they're doing, but I do know that, particularly in this city, a lot of cities, when somebody wants a good coach or a good player, they work it out. They get it figured out, they put forth the effort from that whole organization to go recruit the kind of person that they need. And I think the thing, same thing can go on in terms of employment. And I think that um, social media, you know, um, it, it can be used for a good thing. And um, not that people have a lot of time, you know, to just browse through social media, but look for different things that you may not have ever thought about attending and attend those things. People are doing Zooms all day long um, and just jump on some of those to you know diversify yourself yeah I think the key is really educating yourself and seeking out the information um, there are many books there's many blogs there's many podcasts that will give you the type of information you'll need that you could then activate and act on um, and, and what's also true is those people in your group uh, the ones that do have that knowledge uh, try to have conversations with them across difference rather than quiz versations. I think one thing that is true is um, as more of, uh, of our white allies want to have conversations, what they really become is kind of quizzes in terms of what they should do, what they shouldn't do, and how to, and, and that's, that's not dialogue, that's not rapport. So understanding that we're bringing these unique lived experiences to the conversation, engage in that and be willing to be vulnerable and share your misunderstandings, your, the myths that you grew up under, believing that have informed your biases. Because uh, you know, coming to me or any of us looking to learn without revealing any of the complexities of your understanding, it's really just you trying to have me solve your problems. And that's not a true dialogue. Let's have some conversation about what you misunderstand, what you, what you may have believed in the past that you want to think differently about. And in that way, we can be more collaborative in how we solve problems. This question is from Randy Weston from T. Marzetti, and it, he says it's a two-part question. Where's the balance between reaching and educating those who are already set in their ways versus the younger generation where, where there are still impressionable years left to really make change? And second, how do you continue to raise the awareness of other ethnicities who either don't realize that real racism exists or they are a minority with the different but similar problems of their own? I think I can sum that up both of those questions in one with one particular scripture. You know, he, uh, in the word it says that basically if somebody is willing to listen, when you go to them and you talk to them and they're not able, you, they're not able to be reasoned with, you shake the dust off of your feet and you keep moving. Um, there are going to be some that we are going to be able to penetrate their hearts and they're going to have that desire to change. They're going to have that desire to want to become a part of God's community, right? And then there's going to be some that just are not willing to look at people for ind as individuals as opposed to a collective of people. So when you have those type of situations, you do what you can knowing that you've done your best and you keep moving. Yeah, yeah, and I would add to that, Adrian, that um, our obligation is to engage in consistent action. Our obligation is not to change anyone's minds. And so whenever we see something that's problematic, our requirement is to speak on it. 
and, and whether it changes your mind or not. And so those people who are resistant to change, resistant to understanding in different perspectives, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to continuously bring it up whenever I see it. And, and, and so that's ultimately the, the mandate, is when you see something that's wrong, when you see something that requires uh, uh, addressing, you address it and you bring it up always. That consistent action does lead to change. And so, um, and I think going back to our young people, um, our young people are watching and they're learning and they're bringing their own ideas and energy. And so we need to create pathways to amplify their voices as well because there's a lot we can learn from them. Tim Hopman, how can we uh, develop better co uh, collaboration across groups in different cities across Central Ohio? And he doesn't designate anything about what groups he's talking about. Oh, so I, I, I will point. I want to ask Jerry to speak on this one because I think you're pretty familiar with this particular. So if you think about, um, let's just they said different groups within Central Ohio. If you mm -hmm. think about Bexley. Mm -hmm. And we use Nelson Road as the divide. Right. You talk about dystopia versus utopia. Mm -hmm. How do you, how would you, would you recommend we engage a community like Bexley in this conversation, knowing that they neighbor a community that is having an entirely different experience? Well, it's interesting uh, you asked me that because uh, one of my mentors is Mark Feinkenhoff, mm -hmm. and he was the uh, city developed. Uh, developer of Bexley for 26 years right? and and he has been one teaching me about community for so long and so the difference that I see there that was set up to build community everything that's needed for those folks there that pride everything in terms of the uh, investments and all were there African-American community Anywhere in the country, you see the freeway go right straight through where our business and our residents were. And that was done a while ago, and that was intentional. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about community, we already know what's happened. The same thing happened with the soldiers and everything else. So I know we were getting short on time, so I'll hold up on that. But I would just suggest people look up Red Summer, yeah. 1919, Red Summer. Thank you. Jane, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'll just uh, conclude. I, Sean, you mentioned parental in involvement, engagement. What kinds of things are you doing to make sure that parents really are engaged so that students do have um, an upbringing and they can, they can get a lot of that influence from a good home? Oh, I, well, this, <laughs> or this summer, I mean, not this summer, but you know, when online learning started, you know, MBK um, launched this boost program, which was bridging optimism and opportunity for our students, um, which allowed us to be uh, intent, allowed us to partner with 10 community organizations to provide, you know, the academic assistance that, that students needed. And we've seen that when the pandemic started, um, the black community suffered because we weren't prepared for online learning. And so addressing that instant need of education, but also putting in, putting, using CARES Act dollars um, to fund community organizations that are in these students' circumference, meaning that they feel comfortable going to our rec centers, they feel comfortable going to um, um, people, program managers who are leading these organizations because that's where their comfort is. And so for parents, it's staying involved, right? You know, making sure that students, you know, work is being checked, making sure they know that they're going to this rec center at this time, you know, having, keeping students engaged is a way to, to keep them away from staying in trouble. And I think that by using the LECs to, to one, give our students programming, academic assistance, meals, and mentorship um, helped, you know, during this fall semester of online learning. So, you know, for us, that's the key. And then, you know, staying up to date with MBK updates. You know, MBK has done a lot. You know, most recently we launched our um, We Rise Scholarship Fund that addresses the educational gap that kids have, especially during the pandemic. And so with, with that scholarship fund, it allows kids to pursue higher education if they want it. You know, and so, like I said, we talked about other resource access for parents is what's the best way for us to reach you so that you can know um, opportunities that students have to, to, to stay engaged. Thank you, uh, Jerry Saunders, Adrian Hood, Chris Sewell. Uh, thank you for this conversation and engaging this dialogue. Uh, I know there's so much more that we can talk about and we're really just scratching the surface of these conversations, but I think the, the most important point is that they, these conversations have to continue as well as the work. So uh, I appreciate the time. I'll turn it back over to Steve Marks to close us out. Thanks a lot. Thank you, LaShawn. I hope you found today's forum uh, enlightening and hopeful, maybe at times difficult, but there's a lot of work to be done. It should not be intimidating. It should be inspiring. And, and if, if all of us move 
daily and try and be better people and work together, I think we can accomplish great things. I really um, want, I've got a few announcements here. Um, our forum next week will uh, feature a conversation on race equity and how, how all of us can be involved in conversations towards change. Thanks for our live stream support today presented by the Emergency Response Fund to the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the United Way of Central Ohio, the Columbus Dispatch and PNC, sponsored by Encova and Marzetti, and all of our online virtual seat patrons. Uh, thank you all. A special thanks to our speakers. We could not do this without you. Chris Sewell, Adrian Hood, Jerry Saunders, and LaShawn Carter. We hope to see you again soon, but until then, be well and stay safe.